invite Dr. Catherine Evans to the to the lectern. Uh, Catherine is a senior research fellow with an, a convener of industry development and extension, the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture at the University of Tasmania. And Catherine's going to talk around te transformative technology, in particular reference to sensors. So please welcome Dr. Catherine Evans. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and I'd like to say thanks to all for the opportunity to be here. Well, this presentation has been shaped uh, by the work that we've been conducting under the Sense T program at the University of Tasmania. Well, this slide was put up at a recent wine industry conference, and it's an image that will either make you feel very anxious or, ironically, it might even provide some relief. Whatever. We know that you mob in the bush are an innovative lot. NBN Fixed Wireless came to Culcairn in New South Wales recently. Murray's house was just outside the coverage area, so his solution was to put in this relay station in a far paddock that had an NBN address. So my first message is that innovation starts with you. Well, the role of science and research in the innovation process is just that. It has an important place, but it is not the sole source of innovation. Innovation requires bringing different types of knowledge together. Now, as a researcher, I'm trained to generate and codify my knowledge in the form of a scientific publication or even in software code. We call this explicit knowledge, but it doesn't mean that that knowledge is necessarily usable. An equally important form of knowledge is what we call tacit knowledge. And that includes what we call local or experiential knowledge. This is your know-how. It's the stuff inside your head. It's the learning by doing. It's the trial and error. It's the stuff you learn in the school of hard knocks. Now, we need to integrate both explicit and tacit knowledge to create actionable knowledge. And if you think about it, smart devices are really just integrating the tasks that people have always undertaken in their everyday work and life. What's new, though, is our capacity to source vast amounts of disparate data and then integrate fit-for-purpose data into the algorithms that will give us a tailored answer. So let's now focus on the grape and wine industry, which is a very intensive form of agriculture. Now, this industry needs data to underpin all the different stories that we need to tell our consumers, our customers, and even our local community. At present, there are multiple sources of different types of data of variable quality. Data is expensive to gather and interpret, and it's why so many of us revert, revert to gut feel for our decision making. So let's now look at one area where data can support decision making, and that's around the need to manage the various weather-based risks. And you know what they are, disease, heat, frost, flood. So we need to identify where conditions are risky, and then we need to um, ask two questions. And that is, what specific information do we need to manage that risk, and how can we source that information cost efficiently? So we conducted a series of workshops with representatives from the Tasmanian grape and wine industry to understand their requirements for managing weather-based risks. So the two key questions were, what are your most important decisions in the vineyard going through the growing season? And what information do you need to support those decisions? And here we're referring to the information based on data from environmental sensors. So the gear that might be on an automatic weather station, data from a soil moisture probe, um, and so on. So by the end of the workshop, we had uh, vineyard managers, their consultants, and our local industry development officer drawing their ideal app on butcher's paper. And I think they had a lot of fun doing this, um, and they, but they really appreciated the fact that they could shape this app and what it, would, what it would eventually do and how they would interact with it. But you, before you go and build an app, then you need to understand what's available already. And you know yourself that there is a plethora of apps out there delivering information about the weather. There are also a number of end-to-end -end proprietary solutions, such as frost alarms, irrigation apps, and so on. Now, the way these systems work is that data from the in-field sensors is sent by telemetry to some form of data storage. 
Then there's a layer of software that does the various calculations, and then uh, that's the data analytics, and then another layer of software that presents that information on a computer screen or smart device. But data science is now giving us new capabilities. And what we talk about now is the data value chain. And it's all about uh, getting efficiencies, a technology that gives us the efficiency to take that data and more efficiently turn it into information, information becomes knowledge, and so on. So down in Tasmania, for example, we are building a big data platform under a program called SenseT. Now this platform can ingest data from different makes and models of environmental sensors into the one data platform. So the different coloured arrows represent different data streams. So the platform then converts that data into a standard format and describes its content for recognition by the data analytics software. So what this means is that an app developer can then cherry pick the services that they need for the data analytics, as well as the data stream that fits the app that they want to create. So in short, what this means is that the data are collected once, but they can be used for multiple purposes. So given that SenseT was building this uh, data platform, we designed a Vidi app with data integration in mind and to demonstrate what's possible with this new capability. So VidiApp is a pre-commercial web-based application at the moment, uh, intended to provide situational awareness of weather-based risks. And it also provides alerts about risky conditions. So superficially, it might look just like another weather app, but the point of difference is around being able to select the most fit for purpose data stream for any given location and management issue of interest. And it also allows for more granularity in the information provided. Um, so it's always accuracy for the job at hand. So how it works is that a user will be managing one or more vineyards with a number of patches or blocks. Each patch is then allocated a group of sensors. A group of sensors could be those housed on a particular weather station, or you can create a virtual group of sensors. For example, temperature from a field station, uh, with rainfall coming from your nearest Bureau of Meteorology station, or even forecast data that underpins the MetEye service. So each sensor group then is then allocated to one or more management issues relevant to that particular patch of land. Again, there may be a particular sensor group used for frost alerts, a different group to support decisions, and decisions around irrigation, and so on. Now, we don't have time to go through the app, albeit to say that each management issue for a given vineyard patch or block has its own web page. And alerts can also be received uh, via the app or by SMS or email, and their, their users set thresholds. Well, I said earlier that our industry has been actively participating in development of this app, and they have been giving us feedback through an iterative user-centred process. One person said, well, we might start seeing patterns in the data that we'd never seen before. Well, I'm a great believer in farmers' rules of thumb, and uh, you can imagine a researcher picking up on a farmer's insights and then exploring if there truly is a relationship in the patterns being observed. Which brings me uh, to the next steps in developing this type of decision support. So developments in artificial intelligence mean that the computer can understand your situation and the way you are interacting with it. This means that the machine can learn in a way that the next time information is supplied, it becomes even more useful. Now, intelligent decision support is not unlike the support you might get from an experienced and trusted advisor. Indeed, humans are not removed from this equation because the system is intended to support the discussions between you, your peers, and your service providers. And my ICT colleagues and I would love to develop a technology called case-based learning. Uh, indeed, we're always on the hunt for research, research funding, so I'm just dropping a big hint there. <laughs> Finally, um, I urge each and every one of you to learn more about digital technologies and to jump at every opportunity to participate in research and development. There's an epidemic of researchers out there building solutions that are looking for a problem. 
we need to turn that around and create innovation platforms that can harness our different types of knowledge and, importantly, your know-how. So thank you for your attention.